deeper. Amen. And so it is. And so please welcome back. Second shot. And Pete Kirkland. Come on, Pete Kirkland. We're really happy to have Pete back in the house.
Between uh, Pete's song and Karen's reading, how perfect is that? And I'm going to read it again because I think it's important because it really does capture what we're talking about today. Unity. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one God. I and my Father are one. We, who hath seen me has hath seen the Father. Ernest Holmes says, perhaps the most difficult things for us to perceive as is that there is one life running through everything. One presence manifest in everything. One person individualized through everything. The perception of unity sees through all differences to one universal sameness. But unity does not mean uniformity. We do not all have to be alike, think alike, or act alike. But the world is learning that we must all act in unison. The infinite one manifests in infinite variations, each rooted in the one, but each divinely unique in its own right. Good, bad, high, low, across, above, and beneath, are all one to the infinite mind. Today I seek my union with life. Today my imagination reaches back through all differences to the universal sameness. Today I know that I am in God, God is in me, and we are one. Today, as never before, I shall seek to sense this divine union of the soul with its source and of all people with the infinite. If we would come to the universal wholeness, we must approach it through the law of its own nature. This means we must give our undivided attention to the spiritual unity back of all things. And so today, we talk about kingdoms three and four. 
We talked about kingdoms one and two. Kingdom one, by the way, and I don't think I mentioned this last week. Kingdom one is physical. Everything's happening to me. Kingdom two is mental. Everything is done by me. Kingdom three is spiritual. Everything is done through me. It is where we move out of thinking that we are separate. We have to give up control. Dang it, right? How many of us really want to give up control in our life? I don't. And yet kingdom three is that realizing that God is working through us all the time. And so to really embrace that, to embody that, to be that. And the way we do that is through spiritual practice. Michael Beckwith talks about it is one thing to chant and to read. It is another thing to live in that place of knowingness. The Father and I are one. And so in Kingdom 3, we are allowing that divine presence to work through us. We are realizing that there is something bigger than just me out there, and I surrender to it. Anytime I fall into judgment or gossip or um, being unkind, I'm pulled out of Kingdom 3 and I'm back right into Kingdoms 1 and 2. We are going to travel in our lifetime through all four kingdoms. I think the practice for us as humans is to figure out how can we spend as much time, and I'm not going to say Kingdom 4, I'm going to say Kingdom 3. How can we spend as much time as possible in Kingdom 3? And I will tell you sometimes it can be emotionally exhausting. It's much easier to judge somebody than to not. It is much easier when somebody says something about somebody else to want to know more instead of being quiet. I have a friend that recently noticed that I'm really practicing staying in Kingdom 3. And she said, I've noticed you don't gossip anymore. That when somebody says something to you, you're either silent or you change the subject. Unless they're talking about themselves, right? They're sharing their own experience. But we have this de default thing as humans. For whatever reason, we bond over talking about other people. In the office, we call it um, the um, water fountain talk. Right? Everybody's hanging out at the water fountain, talking about their boss, or talking about the boss's secretary, or talking about the boss and the boss's secretary. I worked in an office like that. There's a lot of gossip going on. And yet, I believe the practice for us as humans is to rise above that. And to rise above that, you really have to be conscious. And that's why I say it can be really emotionally tiring. The world is coming at us in nanoseconds now. It was probably easier, maybe, in the time of Jesus. First of all, less people. Secondly, no internet. Right? No TV. They didn't even have Pony Express. You know, information moves slower. And so for us, that's why I say it can be emotionally tiring because we are bombarded with this crap all the time. There is a great teaching. Um, I learned it from the Stoics. Uh, Cynthia learned it from um, A Course in Miracles. There is, it's a great teaching about complaining. And the thing about complaining is, if you can't change it, don't give a voice. You know, if you're going to complain about something and there is nothing that you can do to change the outcome, stop it. 
Don't give it any more energy than it already has. So for me, that is, um, you know, complaining or giving voice to uh, something that I've noticed recently is, um, well, I'll go back to driving on the freeway because it's safer to talk about it. So driving on the freeway. I have no control over other drivers. I have no control, Here, here's one. I have no control over drivers who are looking at their cell phones while they're driving. Dangerous as that is, if you are a passenger in a car and you look over at the cars that are driving next to you, I swear to God, nine in 10 of the people driving, they got their cell phone here and they're driving with the same. Because they haven't been in that car accident that they've killed themselves or somebody else yet. So they think, that happens to other people. I got this. I know what I'm doing. We passed somebody like that this morning, probably more than one person, but one person I noticed as she's driving, she's looking at herself on like this. And I thought, wow. And yet I can't change that, can I? I can't make her stop using her cell phone. She's not my daughter. She's not my best friend. She's nobody I didn't even know her. So complaining about it, what does that do? It adds complaining energy to the universal whole. And if we are all energy, we want to shift that. So how many of you are empathic? How many of you find the world right now, oh my God, it's tiring, is it not? Yeah. How many of you actually spend time running your energy to protect yourself? Because if you really are doing that, and I mean really doing it, every single day, getting rid of anything that doesn't belong to you, really running your energy and setting that bubble around you, you won't feel the world around you. And so if the world's getting in, you need to do uh, more running your energy. And what I mean by that is obviously more often, you know, uh, I was told, run your energy in the morning. Right now, are you kidding me? Run your energy every hour. Three city blocks. Three city blocks, think about that. I learned this from an empath, her name's Marie Manicherry, and she talks about because she um, sees things, she's an intuitive and she sees energy and, she's, and, and energy speaks to her. And somebody asked her in a class, how can you be out in public? That must drive you crazy. And she said, no, I run my energy all the time. I ground myself with Mother Earth. I feel into and know that I am emotionally and physically connected and grounded to Mother Earth. And then as I breathe, I take a deep breath in and on the out breath, I blow out an energy bubble one block. I breathe in, I blow out an energy bubble, two blocks. And the third one is three blocks. Three blocks. And I imagine now she does it all day long. So that is something, if you're an empath and you are feeling emotionally challenged, run your energy more often. And I know this sounds, remember the old tree hugger comments that we used to do all the time? However, what is more grounded in Mother Earth than a tree? So the other thing to do is go out and literally hug a tree and say to the tree as you're hugging it, please take from me all the energy that does not belong to me. Now, I'm a little self-conscious. So going outside and hugging a tree, I'm like, I don't want the neighbors talking about me. However, the neighbors never talk about anybody that goes out, sits down and backs up to a tree, right? Just put your back up to a tree. Because it is important that you own and become God through me, kingdom three. And you can't get there if you let the energy of the world wear you down. And the more people that can do God through me, 
the sooner we're going to change the vibration of the planet. That's why it's important. Kingdom three is really, really important. Is kingdom four important? You bet. Except the kingdom four, who? God as me. No separation. Unity consciousness. Kingdom three is transpersonal personal consciousness. That means that um, my higher self, my higher self has taken that higher position, if you will. My lower self is still there. I go in and out, probably of one and two, and I practice being in kingdom three. Kingdom four is about unity. It is the realization at the very core of who I am, there is no separation between me and any of you, me and anybody that I love to death or anybody that I can't stand. No separation. No separation for people who don't agree with me philosophically, politically, uh, emotionally. People who are so different from me that we look at each other and think, we got nothing in common. Yes, we do. One heart, one mind, one soul, one God. Doesn't matter how you practice it. That's what we have in common with our fellow persons on this planet. And those that need to feel that the most are those that feel the most separate. And who feels the most separate? People who can and will do things against humanity or, them, or you know, people who, um, gangs of people who go into a Nordstrom's. They are feeling separate. Because if they felt at one moment, if they felt unity, if they felt a brotherhood of man or a sisterhood of man or however you want to say that, if they really felt that, then they wouldn't be able to do that. Now somebody might say, well, that's just a corporation, so what difference does it make? It's a corporation with humans in it. There are people that work there, that have families, that go to work every day and want to feel safe. Because isn't that what we all want to feel? We all want to feel safe. We all want to feel like we're loved. And when we act out, it's because we don't feel loved. We don't feel seen. There was a great, you know, what I love about um, football playoff season is they all do um, those insights into football players and the things that they're doing for the community. And there was one football player they were talking about, I will not remember his name or the team he was playing for, so I apologize for that. But he was really, really good at what he, what he did, and I think he came from Oklahoma or Oklahoma State. And um, he got hit really hard during the game, and they thought he was never gonna walk again. And when he finally got motion back, what happened was he could never play football again. So the first thing he worked through was kingdoms one and two. Who am I if I don't play football? Who am I? I put, you know, professional football players have been playing football since they were five and six years old. Who am I? And he said he spiraled down. And then he woke up. Either with that, um, that divine intervention, like hit me, or who knows how he woke up. But he woke up. And he started a, I think it's called Cup of Joe. Coffee place. Cup of Joy. Cup of Joy, thank you, Mr. Dillon. Cup of Joy coffee place. And one day he noticed a young man standing out on the street corner. Clothes obviously had been lived in for forever. No shoes on his feet. And he walked out with a cup of coffee. And he sat down with him and he just talked to me. He asked him what was up. 
what had happened in his life. You know, and he said he got into drugs and his family disowned him and his life fell apart. He lost everything. He lost his home. He lost his family. He just sat and talked to him. And then he went back to Cup of Joy. That act. He didn't give him money. He didn't say, you know, come on in to Cup of Joy and sit. He did buy him clothes and shoes. And what he said was, that act was the first time anybody had seen me in such a long, long time that it righted his ship, if you will. He went to community college, and now he's in college. And took him back to Cup of Joy so he could thank the um, ex-football player for seeing him, just seeing him. That is kingdom free. Can you really look at people and not have judgment? Can you really let people be and do their life the way they choose without thinking that you know better or that you have to comment on it? You know, one of the um, comments that has been given to me recently is um, all behavior makes sense. Think about that. All behavior makes sense. Because there's a song that talks about if you haven't walked a mile in their shoes, you have no idea what our fellow humans are going through and why they're behaving the way they're behaving. But I promise you this, what they're looking for is love and compassion and to be seen and heard. And when we start doing that, we really are living in kingdom four. Because then we are seeing humanity as God sees us. Perfect, whole, and complete. That's how we were born. That's who we are. And so it's a remembering. It's a calling back home. It's a rising up. It is a practice. Yes, you'll get tired. But eventually, I think, I hope, it becomes second nature for me. That it becomes who I am to allow God to be gay, God through Gail. And then every once in a while, I'll bounce up into God as Gail. Ooh, ooh, powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. And that's what I want for all of you. Because each and every one of you is God in form. And so you can allow that opening to happen. It just takes practice. And you have to remind yourself all the time. All the time. You know, there's that, that saying that used to people used to say all the time, what would Jesus do? Why don't we up our game? What would God do? What would God do in this situation? And then just practice holding space, not commenting, not reacting, holding space. It's not easy, but it is so magnificent to be there and to know that and to vibrate from that place. And then to have somebody recognize the shift that has happened in you. Because it's not something you go around and tell people. Oh, have you noticed I'm not gossiping anymore? To have somebody notice, that was like a gift from God. And it was. Because that person is God informed too. So our prayer today is going to be something a little different. Miss Karen. Karen did this in her meditation. And it's, pow it's a powerful prayer. It's actually a song, um, but we're not going to sing it. 
but we are going to do it and you might want to stand up and do it with us yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and there's hand motions with it you might know it it's karen brucker and so it starts off we're going to start with i am yeah okay so it starts off i am the face of god the face I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. I didn't know that part, see. I am the face of God. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are a face of God. We are the face of God. We hold each other in our hearts. We are a part of each other. We are the face of God. Namaste. Please welcome back Pete Kirkland and second shot.
Hey, Kirkland, second shot. Thank you.